Hello. You can hear me? Okay. So my voice is, is doing strange stuff. So you'll be uh, having a hearing test, and now I'm giving you an, a reading test. Can anybody read the, that on the screen? Oh. You. This better? Still too small. No, that's small. No, okay. Hopefully this will work better. Okay. So there was yesterday a tutorial about SE Linux. Um, mine is a presentation going through the basic stuff. Um, Normally, if you read the early scriptures, everybody would have told you life is too short to learn as a Linux. Um, I'm going to try to explain you that in 35 minutes, I think I have. So hopefully you'll still be alive in 30 minutes. Yeah, so I'm Toshan Bavani. I'm from Antwerp, Belgium, little country in Europe. Uh, Self-employed. I'm involved in enterprise Linux, which basically translates to CentOS, Red Hat, um, I do some of the proprietary uh, BSD stuff, AIX. Um, I'm, I do a little bit of free BSD and open BSD. Um, that's how I got involved in SE Linux. Um, I like virtualization. I run Config Management Camp, if anybody is interested in that. Um, I like Ansible, Foreman, Puppet. And yeah, I'm sometimes on social media. Don't find me there too often. So an introduction, uh, then what is SE Linux and some ways how to use it and how to um, live with it on your system in, in, a, uh, in, in enforcing mode. Um, so who of you actually already uses SE Linux? And I'm talking in enforcing mode. Huh? Uh, nobody actually. Well, two hands I see from here. Okay. Uh, anybody in permissive mode? Okay, also two people. So the rest of you are all disabled. Okay. So yeah, one basic misconception is SE Linux is a horrible beast. It will eat you alive and you will be dead. All your production systems will die horribly and you won't be able to live anymore. That isn't true anymore. If you were running versions, uh, so CentOS 4 or even CentOS 5 maybe, that might have been true. In CentOS 4, definitely. You really needed to know what you were doing. Um, in uh, uh, CentOS 5, that improved. So when I say CentOS 5, I'm talking about CentOS, Red Hat, Scientific, all the other variants that are based on that uh, distribution. Um, if you are a fancy geek running Gen 2, then you always have the latest one, so that doesn't apply to you. Um, only in SLES 12, I think, um, as the Linux has been enabled. Um, previous versions had App Armor, uh, which today Ubuntu uses. Um, it doesn't do much. So, another uh, very common thing is it's a pain in the ass. Yes, I know that. Um, but it's very easy to work with nowadays. And then there are um, vendors who will tell you to actually disable that. So um, the lovely people from the O company, they love to tell you, please disable this because AWSB won't support you. Unfortunately, if you need to work with them, then yes, you must do that. However, if you run your systems with as a Linux, you get Chuck Norris in there. So you'll be happy to know that he will kill all the bad guys for you. Now, SE Linux was developed by the NSA, and now most people will be thinking there's some backdoor in there, but the NSA actually built it and open sourced it directly. Um, now, multiple people uh, from multiple companies have looked at these uh, codes and have actually checked the code and verified that there are no backdoors in there. 
it's a kernel module, so it has also gone through all the scrutiny of being um, accepted in the kernel itself. So if you really have a lot of time on your hands, you can manually read all the code and double check that there are really no backdoors in there. Um, but presuming you have other things to do, you can just accept what other people have told you. So what is Azure Linux? So first we need to understand what traditional uh, Unix uh, permissions are. In Unix, everything is a file. So we're going to secure a file. Sorry. Um, so we're going to secure a file. Um, and the file can be secured by a 3 by 3 matrix, which is basically your user, your group, and the others. You can give them read, write, or execute permissions. And that's how you get these binary statements, um, which you use chmod 777, whereby everybody could do everything with it. Which is not the most convenient thing to do, but it's the most easiest example to give. Now, as a Linux is security enhanced Linux, it's a mandatory access control. So it basically um, denies everything unless you allow it to do something. Now, it has policies which I loaded into the kernel. Well, there's a kernel module which loads policies, and these policies basically tell what is allowed by which um, type of which uh, daemon, which file can be used, because everything will get a label. So a specific label will be allowed to do certain things with other labels. Um, now, you need to have a kernel that is compiled with Azure Linux. So if you compile your own, own kernel, you go to security features, and there there's a, as a Linux, and then you can enable it. Um, you compile your kernel. Um, again, if you're running most of the enterprise Linuxes, they have that already enabled in there. And everything is a label or a context, and that is basically defined in three types. Uh, the type enforcement, the role-based, um, control and the multi-level. I'm not going to talk that much about multi-level because it's um, a higher level of um, uh, control which allows you to, to do multiple things at the same time. Um, but the type enforcement is the most commonly used one. The role-based enforced one is basically when you log in with root, you get into the unconfined mode, which allows you to basically do anything on your machine, which could be one of the reasons why you execute something as root and it would work, and when you execute it as a different user, it wouldn't work. So access control is based on the type enforcement, um, which basically tells you that a specific context can do certain things to another context. So the object, let's say um, an Apache, daemon can read all um, files with the label of HTTP underscore um, RW access T. You'll see that most of these things end on a T, stating that they are basically a type enforcement. The role based would be that you as a user root would be unconfined, or you could actually have that the root would be confined, which means that you as a root user would not be able to do everything on your machine. This is um, sometimes relevant for people who work in larger corporations where you're not allowed to see the data, but you still need to manage all the machine. Then you could actually put the data in a different type, uh, whereby you as a root user would not be able to access the data, but still be able to do all your operations on the machine. Uh, the multi-level um, is mostly on being able to have uh, multiple objects talk to multiple subjects. Um, it's, on, it's mostly used if you use SFIRT, um, which is basically containerizing your uh, VMs in specific uh, groups. Uh, and then you can tell that these VMs can only talk to each other. Uh, they can see underlying file systems, or they can connect to specific network cards, and so on. So if you want to look at it visually, um, normally if a process asks um, for access, it will talk to the kernel. 
and the kernel will basically tell you, yes, you get access to that file, or no, you don't get access to that file. In the as a Linux version, you have the kernel which loads the as a Linux module. Um, the module will actually load the policy database, and that policy database will then tell you that, okay, you as Apache can only see anything with the Apache labels. And so you get restricted to your one confined um, center. And so if you get an attack, you are less likely to have whole, your complete system compromised, and only that section of your system would be compromised. So these are the features. <coughs> the most important is that you actually have a base policy, but you can actually quite easily generate policies yourself. Um, these policies are generated based on the audit log, so you need to have your audit logs running. Um, today there are tools like audit to allow and audit to why, which will actually explain you what is happening, so you don't need to understand all the cryptical mess messages. Um, if you are really um, daring, you can actually change base policies. Just remember that if you are running a distribution and you change anything in the base policy, the next time you do an update of the base policy, all your changes will be wiped out. Um, it controls file systems, directories, uh, sockets, ports, network interfaces, daemons. So it basically controls everything that runs on your machine. <coughs> so if you're running a simple web server, it will not allow you to run um, your uh, web files just anywhere. You will need to tell as a Linux that, oh, they are located there. Of course, the base policy has the default locations in there, but if you need to run it off an NFS, then you will need to tell um, the database basically that, please allow me um, to run my website from an NFS server. Um, so in a way, it disallows misbehavior. Um, it's a good annoyance if you have junior in your company, you want to annoy them, because it will actually not tell anything in the error logs of the application itself. It will just tell you Apache wasn't able to start up. Okay, that doesn't tell you much. Um, and it can even restrict the root user, as I explained. So if you look, um, about five years ago, it was only the kernel which was um, enabled. You had uh, then an initiative from Postgres to have SE Postgres, which basically means that you can even confine databases and uh, today even tables and columns to specific as a Linux users, uh, be it uh, users of the system or users on the database level. Um, Apache has a, uh, a mod which you can install, which can also do that. Um, PHP today also has an, uh, an, an extension for that. So while we don't have the full uh, stack available yet, uh, most of the standardized applications are available. If you're running your own application, you can easily write um, uh, a policy by just running it in permissive mode in development, um, running audit to allow, and it will actually generate a basic policy you will have to filter out still some stuff. I'm not saying that you don't need to do any effort, uh, but it won't um, tell you everything. Well, you don't need to write everything from scratch anymore. So where do we find as a Linux? Um, it was merged into mainline kernel in uh, 2.6.0, uh, somewhere around 2002. So it's been around for the last 15 years. So it's quite stable by now. Um, yeah, so Red Hat, CentOS, Scientific from version 4, uh, Novel, Gen 2. Debian also has uh, some uh, versions of it. If you have an Android phone and it's a newer version, you also have as a Linux running on your phone. Um, Ubuntu still chooses to have AppArmor as a default, uh, but you can, if you really want to, run as a Linux also there. So again, 
Why would we want to use it? It confines processes, services, users in compartments. So allowing you to only have, well, if you have a problem, it will only be in that particular compartment. Um, you can use that for virtual machines. There's an extension called SVIRT. Um, if you're running uh, version 7, that's enabled by default. Um, if you want to do more advanced stuff, then you'll have to go to lower level. Um, if you run kiosks for a living, then you can use XGuest, which also runs as a Linux, which basically allows the user to do anything um, within his confined uh, kiosk console that you set up. Um, if you have a German-built car, then you most likely also have as a Linux running in your car. Um, USB redirect. Um, so if I plug in a USB device here and I want it to be used on a virtual machine um, somewhere around the world, uh, 9 out of 10 chances it's also running some version of as a Linux to make sure that that specific uh, USB is being redirected to that one specific machine only. It does that by um, subdividing categories uh, within the labels. So that's the theoretical part. Are there any questions already? Okay. So yeah, um, I asked already how many people used enforcing, permissive, and disabled. If you're running it in enforcing, then it's on, which means that your system is secured. Um, anything that um, would not be allowed gets denied and goes into your audit log. Um, if you are running in permissive mode, uh, it will actually allow those things, but it will still... One minute. Sorry. Um, it will still allow you to see the denied messages so that you can actually generate a policy. Um, once you have generated the policy, you can then load it into the system, keep the system still in permissive mode, and see if any other error messages are being created or denied messages. Uh, and then you can filter out from there what is being uh, done. Of course, if you run it in disabled mode, then it's off. So it's basically not loading the kernel module, and you have no advantage of the system. Now, given that you just get a machine like that, you don't know what... Um, the, the status of uh, as a Linux is, you can run a command called as a status and it will actually tell you um, what the machine is running. Uh, let's see. So it will tell you, for instance, enabled. Uh, it will tell you also which uh, policy version it's running and if MLS is enabled or not. So the policy version is the base policy that gets loaded into the machine. That comes mostly from your distribution. Um, if it would be in permissive mode, it would just uh, tell you the same thing, but with permissive. If it's disabled, it just gives you one line with disabled. Um, now, most of the commands that we know already today, if you add capital Z, you actually get the uh, as a Linux uh, labels or contacts. Um, so ls minus capital Z will actually give you the context of all the files. Uh, netstat minus Z will give you all the context of the ports, and ps will give you all the context of the daemons. Uh, no, that was it. If I knew how to. Sorry, that's the largest I can go. It doesn't go any larger. Or 
I could do. So is this better? Sorry? Now, yeah. So you see here uh, the files. These are just files in my home directory. Um, but you see there that you have the traditional uh, Unix permissions. You then have the owners, and then you have the context of uh, as a Linux. So in this case, admin underscore home underscore t. Uh, this part is the most important because that's the type, um, which basically admin home is your root. Uh, directory. Uh, sorry, your root user directory. Um, if I would do the same um, If I would do the same on var www, which is already defined in the base policy as the default uh, web um, directory, you see that you get the HTTP syscontent t uh, type. So that means that any daemon that is uh, flagged with HTTP d uh, type can actually read these files. So if you're running uh, Apache, uh, but if you're running Nginx, that's the same thing. So again, if you're running most of the common web servers, they're already known. And once you install them, it will actually tag the daemon with the correct uh, type enforcement rules already by default. If you've written your own web server, then you'll have to actually write a policy for that. So mostly, if you read up in the documentations, you'll find objects, objects which basically can be labeled. Um, files normally get labeled um, by uh, in the file system. So it's supported in most file system, not all. Um, again, if you're using fancy file systems, that doesn't work. Most of the common Unix file systems are supported and can uh, handle the extended attributes. Um, now, the labels can be set manually. I think that's the next slide. Yeah. So labels can be set manually using a command called chcom, which basically changes the context of a file. So if you wanted to have um, in the folder user server www your website, then this would be the command, the first one. Now, the capital R is to do it recursively. The T stands for the type you want to do it. Um, and of course, this is very nice because it will start working. Now, the next time you reboot your machine, you'll see that nothing works again. Because every time um, the uh, restore daemon or the uh, machine gets rebooted, it will actually set the files back to the default labels. 
Now to prevent that, you can actually inject that into the database itself. And for that you use as a manage. So in that case you would use as a manage, we want to add a specific file context um, to the uh, specific type and then you need to use some regular expression to actually get that into the database. Which means that all files, folders, um, any other things under user SRV www would actually be labeled under that specific context. So the next time you reboot, the next time RestoreCon runs in the background, um, your files will still be, have the correct label and your web server would still be able to read them. Now, if you have, for instance, SCP'd um, files from your laptop to your home directory and you copy them from your home directory to your web server, you'll see that actually nothing works. Because the minute you SCP to the um, host, it will get a label at that point. And given that you SCP'd into your home directory, you'll actually get a label with home in it. Now when you copy the files, it doesn't it copies the label that it originally had. It doesn't copy what the destination would be. Now if you want to restore all of those back to the defaults, then you can use RestoreCon. Uh, again, the capital R is to do it recursively and it would do it for all these files and set it back to the default. Now let's say you have, like most people here, your machine in disabled mode. Then you would actually, if you st uh, enable as a Linux, you would get into trouble in the sense that none of your files would be labeled correctly. Now to do that, you need to um, relabel your home directory, and then you need to um, put a file in the root um, called dot auto relabel, and then reboot your machine. What will happen at that moment is the machine will reboot. Uh, it will load up in run level one and will actually start relabeling whole your file system. So if you have a few petabytes of data, this can take a long time. While it's relabeling, your machine is offline. Um, so <coughs> it's advisable to keep um, as a Linux in permissive mode. It makes life easier afterwards. If you have it in disabled during your installation, then your in installer um, will actually not label the files correctly because it doesn't see the use of doing that. Um, you can use also fixed files which will actually uh, tell you what specs were for this specific location and how they were being applied there. Now, in the beginning, policies were made and you had to follow the policies. Now, many people actually found this quite restrictive so there are now booleans that you can actually uh, flip which will allow you to do certain things which a normal system does not always require. So for instance, um, a web server will automatically be allowed to uh, connect on port 80 because without port 80 you wouldn't be able to serve your website. Now port 8181 is not a very common port but if you want to use this then you need to add this to the specific context that you need. So to get a list of the default ones, it's uh, as a manage port minus L, which will give you the whole list. Uh, if you want to add that, uh, if you want to add a specific one, you do minus A, then minus T for the type, and minus P for the protocol that it's going to use. And so even if you want to run SSH on a different port than 22, you need to actually uh, tell as a Linux that I'm going to run it on port 5022 um, and add that to the database because otherwise it won't allow you to do that. <coughs> so the files example I gave already but again here if you're not sure what file context um, is being used or what is there by default you can always use minus L and it will actually give you the list of all the file contexts and the directories that are being um, tagged automatically for that specific uh, context. Now, the booleans, you can get get essay bools, which will give you all the booleans uh, that are available, 
and then you can grab on Samba. Um, so for instance, if you run a Samba server and you want to uh, allow home directories to be shared, by default this isn't allowed. Um, so you would actually have to set the Boolean to on. By default it's off. The minus capital P here sets it persistent. That means that even the next time the base policy will get uploaded, um, it will keep your value and not the default value. Now, the main thing about AZ Linux is that if you have a web server like Apache, Nginx, Samba server, um, and you try to start it up, or even your SSH server, you started it up on a different port than 22, it will just tell you failed. It doesn't tell you much more than that, which isn't very descriptive. Um, however, if you look in the audit log, it will actually tell you that a certain process called SSHD tried to attach to a specific port 5022, and it got denied. Uh, the same for a web server, if it tries to connect to the port 8181 and you didn't enable it, it will tell you denied. Um, now, you can basically uh, grab those denied and pipe them to audit to why, and it will give you a nice explanation for what, you did, uh, what went wrong, how it went wrong. Um, you could also use audit to allow, which will generate a policy for you. However, if the booleans already exist, it will actually warn you that please do not in, um, compile this uh, policy, but use the booleans that already exist for that. Um, if you want to get a, a better description on the booleans, because if you use uh, get sa bool minus a, it will just give you the names. It won't give you a, a description. So the minus l here gives you a small description on what the boolean is supposed to do. So once you have such a, a policy, you can actually uh, compile that into a binary form and load it into the database kernel. And at that point, it becomes enforcing into your kernel. Depending on time, I'll see if I can show some. Um, so your subject, your daemon, um, or your process asks the database whether it can actually, uh, sorry, ask the kernel whether it can actually get access to a specific um, object and the database will answer to the um, policy whether it can or cannot do that. Um, and here you see then that the denied message goes into your audit logs if it gets denied. So yeah, you can also use as a search if you want to search on booleans, on types. Um, so if you're quite new, they have a lot of tools to figure out stuff and it will actually explain you in more human uh, readable language what these booleans, what these switches do, uh, what specific file contexts are being used, where and how. Um, so this is the shortest way to generate a policy. Um, you basically look at your audit log, you grab on, in this case, it was a, um, a daemon called Zarafa. Well, no, sorry, I forgot to change that. It's Galera. So the default Galera setup requires you to use rsync, which is allowed. I use uh, Percona extra backup, so you need to allow certain things on, on uh, um, on as a Linux level. So it should read actually grep Galera. Um, from the audit log, you pipe it through to audit to allow and you create, give it a module name Galera and it will actually uh, output you the full policy that you could actually compile already. You can at that point read what the policy is. If you agree or don't agree with it, then you can make some modifications. You run the check module, which basically checks that it doesn't conflict with any existing modules that are already in your database. Then you package it into the binary form, and then you install it into the uh, policy database. Once you run the last command, it becomes active. So this is how a policy actually looks. So you have on top uh, the module name, it will always give you a version. Um, so this is actually 
uh, a modification I made because it will always start with 1.0. Um, it will then tell, well, it will then first state what types and what classes it will be using. Um, and then here below it will tell you what actually um, is being done. So MySQL needs to be able to read the host name to know which of the cluster nodes it's talking to. It needs to be able to use rsync to do the state transfer and then it needs to do a, a set uh, to be able to know where it actually ended and started. So if you see it's not that complicated um, given that it's these uh, the one, two, three, five commands and you get a policy which actually allows you to run that. Yeah, that's all I have for the moment. Unless there are questions or other examples. Uh, hi. Uh, to be true, this seems like quite a lot of hoops to run through to even get a normal web server running. So, uh, taking into account that any startup keeps on growing. At what stage in its growth path do, would you suggest that uh, they move from a disabled to a enabled? From a disabled to an enabled. When is I, the right time well, to invest in this? I would start differently. First and for all, start with permissive. Do not start with disabled. With permissive, you, it, it won't stop your demons, it won't do anything but you will be able to generate policies from there already. And then it depends on what maturity your startup is and how much security is relevant to you. Um, so there were some incidents with Docker where people who were running as a Linux actually didn't get affected. Um, there have been cases in the past where uh, there were bugs in, in certain databases which got, didn't get affected to people running as a Linux. So, yeah, it, it, running in disabled mode today, I feel, is stupid. Uh, given that permissive allows you to do everything, but gives you at least the audit logs, which means that if you have the time, whenever you have the time, you can at least start looking at those. You can at least see if anything relevant or anything is going wrong there. And if it is a small thing, then you can enable it quite quickly. If it is a big work, then, yeah, you might want to postpone that for a later period. Okay, thank you. Hi. Yeah. yeah um, so uh, you talked about compartmentalization and isolation uh, to enhance the security. So, uh, and you, you also mentioned the example of uh, Apache getting compromised, but then it's only limited to a small uh, compartment, so that the whole system isn't compromised. Yeah. But if there's a vulnerability that is exploited that gives some attacker root on my box, then it's basically game over, right? Because he's root, or does SE Linux protect me even in this case? So SE Linux by default will not protect you in that case unless you have confined the, the root user. That's so, also possible. Yeah, so uh, on my production boxes, I confine the root users. So the box I was on to do the, the few tests is not a production box, it's just an extra repository we have. Um, so I don't run root confined there. But on the real production production machines, we run it confined, and root can do basically nearly nothing. Yeah, you update. That's about it. OK, thank you. Excuse me? Yeah. Hello. Um, so how, how well does SE Linux play with uh, Docker? And if so, um, uh, how well grain can you con uh, restrict the different containers you know, running different services? So. Um, I don't remember which version by heart, but the, you now may. So the, in February, there were a few updates for Docker. And from then, it plays well with Docker. So if you're running latest versions of Docker, no problems. Uh, it has namespace abilities. Um, it has full support for as a Linux. If you're running it on CentOS or on Fedora, I have no idea about other distributions. Um, but I presume that most other distributions will be doing as well, maybe some even better.
we had one question this side someone okay then i guess that's about it thanks toshan